2018 was an incredible year for video games. Am I right, Pat? You're so right, George. Oof, it was so good for games. Everyone put games in the office all year long, and it made everyone happy. Look at Bradley. He's just playing the bongos because he played awesome video games. Now for us in the office, we had an incredible year. Oh, hey man. What's up, Brett? How's Good it going? Good to see you. Fine, thank you. I just wanted to congratulate you one more time on reaching one million subscribers. Oh, thank That's you. a hell of a milestone. Thank you, man. Thank you. But you know what? I didn't do it by myself. I did it with all of us as a team. But more importantly, Video Games of 2018 did something that some years don't always do. They make an impact. They make people happy and smile and be joyful. What's up, Ted? Hey, I'm wrapping some presents for some of our subscribers on the Completionist Patreon. There we go. We give gifts away to all of our fans each and every year because video games. And that's the best part about the job. So what'll it be, Slick? <gasps> oh man, a bar? Yeah. Yo, man, I'll take the usual. Boom. One of these, just for you. to 2018 and all the awesome games that came out this year. Number 10. Ah, the king of broken controllers and ruined friendships. The Mario Party series came to us hard this year with Super Mario Party and it is in top form. I'd love to talk about all of the new mini games, but there are 80, so that's just not gonna happen. I am going to highlight, however, some of my favorite ones from the game. The tricycle game Trike Harder is flippin' adorable. How Boo rides a tricycle is still beyond me. The photo game Slapparazzi is a hoot and a half, but my absolute favorite by far is the sword skewering one, Take a Stab. The music and vibe of that one is what I'm all about. The major part of Super Mario Party that I love is the use of character-specific dice blocks and allies. Those elements add a hint of strategy and added individuality to each person's way they'd like to approach the game. Each and every turn becomes unique, not to mention the 2v2 partner party mode, changing how you play the game entirely. With new characters, plenty of new mini games, and ways to play them, Super Mario Party takes everything you've loved about the old games and adds in plenty of moments to keep your friendly rivalries fresh. If you are disappointed with Mario Party in the past, I think it's safe to say that this one makes up for an excellent springboard into the future of this franchise. However, a misstep that Nintendo somehow keeps making time and time again has got to be the online modes. The online is super limited in Super Mario Party. Come on, Big N, go hard on the online mode for your games. Splatoon 1 and 2 are perfect examples of games that embrace this super well. Apply it to everything else in your current technology lineup. Number nine. You all may have remembered that last year on my top 10 worst games of 2017, I talked about Assassin's Creed Origins and how I felt burnt out by it. I honestly thought that this was going to be the same thing again with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but I was really proven wrong. I walked away from this game loving every moment of it. Any game set in ancient Greece has already garnered a lot of appeal for me. The fictional Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta is quite captivating. For me, what set Odyssey apart from the rest was the more Mass Effect vibes the gameplay was dishing out. There's two characters to choose from, romance and dialogue options, and multiple endings. Yeah, those elements are in several games out there, but it's nice to see Ubisoft take a stab at it with their Assassin's flavor. I've been playing the game on and off with my girlfriend Amanda, and we've had a wonderful time with it. And this is a very big game for an Assassin's Creed title. I really don't want to cram it down my throat for an episode anytime soon. I think that would be foolish as betting on an army of 300 Spartans to win against 100,000 to 300,000 Persians. That's madness. Madness. This is Sparta! I'm great. And speaking of madness, let me be the first to admit that out of all of the time-suckingly bad habits I definitely have, the one that causes me the most problems as a completionist is that I love, love, love playing old Super Nintendo-style JRPGs. Believe me, completing games that take hundreds of hours doesn't make it easy for me to do episodes of my show about them very often. But what can I say? Sometimes you love something so much you'll just suffer for it. 
And really, Octopath Traveler was the first of a few tries Square Enix made at the retro done modern style they were trying to hit with the Switch. That unlike I Am Said Sooner or Lost Fear, actually felt authentic and good for me. It's a perfect recreation of the living, breathing world's feel that I remember from Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger without any of the tedious and old-fashioned pitfalls. The graphics are a unique fusion of classic 2D and modern 3D imagery. The soundtrack is an earwormy throwback that's retro without sounding cheesy. With an excellent evolution of the battle system from Bravely Default, turn-based combat feels exciting and active without having to add a timer. Eight separate characters with eight separate storylines give everyone their moment to shine without leaving the overarching plot an unintelligible mess. There's also a class system that's easy enough for the average player to actually experiment and get results with, and everyone gets experience at once so you don't have to keep swapping people out and leveling up your main character too much. Now all this sounds like a bunch of little subtle changes when you list it all out, but honestly, if you play JRPGs as much as I do, you'll learn that quality of life is everything. And if it's not fun doing something once, it's not like doing it for hours and hours is going to make it any better. Don't believe me? Watch this. Hey Ted, how many hours have I put into Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition so far? You sure you want to know? No. Number seven. I am constantly being asked by fans to complete so-and-so game. When are you gonna finish Persona 5? You should play Yakuza 0. Um, hey, great video that you just put 300 hours into, um, but you'd be my favorite YouTuber of all time if you played Baten Kaito's Eternal Wings in the Lost Ocean. This year, the game that was most often brought up to me was Celeste. I knew about this game when it got released, but I didn't have the opportunity to put hands on it until months after the game came out. But as soon as I did, I couldn't put it down. I devoured this game. I was immediately hooked by the Meat Boy slash Towerfall style gameplay. Every screen in the game presented a new challenge for me to face, and another strawberry for me to collect. Every area in the game felt distinct not only due to the game's mechanics found in each stage, but because of the gorgeous level design and kick-ass soundtrack. No joke, I still rock out to this game's soundtrack in my car on my way to work. The presentation and gameplay of Celeste alone would make this one of my top 10 games of the year, but they aren't even my favorite part of the game. Usually, platformers are heavy on the gameplay and light on their narrative. Because of this, Celeste caught me off guard with how deep the story actually was. The game tackles issues revolving around depression and anxiety, and it does it in a way that I haven't seen many games do. I was emotionally impacted by a game that's tagline is, a game about climbing a mountain. Celeste provides challenging gameplay, one of the best soundtracks of the year, and a heartstring tugging story. This game is so much more than just another indie title. It is an experience that will stay with me for years to come. Number six. You guys remember last year when Sonic Mania came out and everyone got really excited to finally revisit classic Sonic? No, no, get out of here, Sonic the Hedgehog 4. I'm talking about Sonic Classic, talking about Sonic Mania. Get out of here! I got to experience that exact euphoric feeling again this year when Mega Man 11 was released. Before this game, it had been nearly a decade without a new game starring our Blue Bomber. Mega Man 11 takes the classic feel of Mega Man and hits it alongside the head with an upgrade bat. Now, we have a new look, a plethora of new challenges, and a brand new gameplay element called the Double Gear System. This mechanic gave me the power to control time and give my big strong man a power boost. The Double Gear System changed how I played Mega Man and I loved it. I also faced one of my hardest challenges of the year completion-wise when I had to take down the soul-crushing Dr. Light Trials. It pushed me so hard, but never in a way that felt unfair. And at the end of the day, I came out none the worse for the wear. <laughs> <laughs> Number five. With the success of Spider-Man Homecoming keeping us occupied in the MCU, Insomniac Studios looked to capture that Spidey buzz with a new standalone Spider-Man game, and oh my goodness did they succeed! A new story arc for a slightly older Peter Parker takes us through battles with some familiar Marvel villains, as well as some newer faces, and it felt full of personality and character. 
It's refreshing to see a slightly older Peter Parker trying to save the city from evil while trying to save his relationship. He's just trying the best he can. He might even sleep as little as I do. The chance to take control of Spidey in a living, breathing New York was just so much fun, with the controls for web slinging feeling super fluid and responsive. There's plenty of bad guys to fight, but the ability to upgrade attacks and skills makes every fight a new experience. And there's plenty to see and do as you travel as well. Taking selfies on top of the Avengers Tower or Doctor Strange Sanctum are a must. And hot damn, talk about these Spidey suits. With so many cool and unique suits from Spider-Man's past, present, and future, I never know what to wear. And the fact that you can combine their skills all together is even crazier. It makes completing the main story an absolute must. Gotta love that Iron Spider suit. And it's not my cup of tea, but you can also play as scantily clad Spidey and really embarrass those giant, tough, arrogant thugs. Number four. The lens I wear for the next game puts aside awards, nominations, and bad company practices and just sees the game at face value. Red Dead Redemption 2 is captivating in cowboy simulation, beauty, and realism. The first installment already proved its worth to me and the sequel really improves upon the formula. Just the beginning of the game eases you in so comfortably. It has a tense winter survival feel shrouded in mystery. It's essentially the hateful eight of game openers. At times, the graphics are so sharp that I think, wait, am I watching literal actors on horseback? What's going on here? It's so good, it's jarring. It took me so long to just get accustomed to the breathtaking graphics. It's not a negative. I just don't know how else to describe my disbelief. It's borderline disturbingly good looking. And if that wasn't enough, the music is a strong element as well. It swells and changes in ever such nuanced way that you notice it isn't even cliche. And yet it still serves its purpose of enhancing and reflecting the mood of the narrative at any given moment. Now the realism did intimidate me a bit at first, but after a while into the game, I really learned to appreciate it and it builds the world in a wholesome manner. You can do good deeds and see the effects in the world or your camp. You can get drunk. You need to keep your guns clean so they can fire the best they can. And you need to keep tabs on your horse and your own health. Red Dead Redemption 2 is real, gritty, beautiful, and well worth every second you invest to. However, in its current state, online mode, eh, no comment. Number three. Now I'm sure a lot of you are not surprised by this, but one of my favorite videos to make this year was on a little game called The Messenger. This game is a freaking masterpiece. I love this game, I love this game, I love this game. It connected with me in such a powerful way. Not solely based on my nostalgia or the pixel graphics, but so much more. Not only is it easily my indie game of the year, The Messenger is probably my favorite indie game of all time. It's up there with Shovel Knight. These two clash every day in my head. I first played the demo for The Messenger at PAX South and I was glued to it. I spent many hours in the demo alone. I had to remind myself to eat. A major strength of The Messenger is that it has simple mechanics with huge potential. To beat this game and dominate the journey, you must grow as a player and master ninja. There is no other way. There's also insane elements like time travel and the time travel is crisp. The graphics swapping in an instant is a testament of the love the devs have for the game. The Messenger is perfectly challenging and a one-stop own it shop. Speaking of the shop, I was so inspired by the game's shop inside and his dialogue that uh, I painted my entire office to look identical to that of a celestial retailer. Now when I complete games, I'm the master of time and space as well. Let's go! Do yourself a favor and play The Messenger. Trust me, there's a whole video I did on it. It'll explain everything you need to know about this freaking game. And just know that somewhere, I'll be riding a dragon along with you guys. Because they call me the Dragon Rider. You get it. Number two. Now, number two and number one fought back and forth in my mind for several weeks now. And after playing both of them for many, many hours and still playing both of them till this day, I'm finally ready to make a decision. It was a hard one, but second place is not bad. A game that slipped into my heart with a couple of swings of an ax, and of course, earner of game of the year for many people out there is God of War. I cannot praise this game enough. 
I have had many God of War games on my show underneath my belt, and Kratos means a great deal to me. For the newest addition to reinvigorate me and impress me so much for the franchise is astonishing. I would like to once again laud the development of Kratos and Atreus. The characters are written so beautifully, their motivations are crystal clear, and their story and gameplay mesh seamlessly. They inspired devotion for me. I could never shake the feeling that I had to do the best in my power to see them succeed and reach whatever goal they were heading towards. My emotional investment in this game runs quite deep. The more time that passes, the deeper that initial experience through the game means to me. Just a playthrough of the story of this game makes it worthwhile. It's beautiful inside and out. Now look, I may be a bit of a fanboy, I get that, but if you're still not convinced based on my passion for this game, then stay tuned for my VR Kratos Extreme Spartan workout routine and beard regiment coming soon. Maybe finally I'll get in shape for once. Number one. Now there have been many, many games this year with massive scopes, with small scopes, with super scopes, but more importantly, every single game that I played this year that I loved had tons of heart, passion, joy, focus, energy. And now, as I sprint through an uphill marathon to tackle this baby for the show, my experience is crystal clear. Regardless, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is my game of the year. Their catchphrase, everyone is here, is not only applicable to Ultimate, but widely becoming true for the Switch. Smash Brothers Ultimate is great for diehard fans to renew their love of the franchise and it's also very approachable for newcomers. Now, some folks may not be totally satisfied with the story mode and world of life, but so far, 30 hours in, it's quite good. It's imaginative, and it gets the player to strategize and creatively overcome and adapt to each and every situation. I do, however, feel that the multiplayer, obviously, in Smash Brothers is the strongest part of the game. You can tailor it in dozens of different ways. Online, however, sounded great in theory with how Nintendo's approaching skill level balance and matchmaking, but so far their execution is leaving a little bit to be desired. Now, I have been working on this episode of Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Completionist for quite some time. Roughly January 6th is when this episode is going to drop, so stay tuned. But more importantly, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is about doing the impossible. Characters who are not meant to fight or collaborate are here, fighting for good, fighting for darkness, and Sora's not even in the goddamn game yet. The fact that we got Joker from Persona 5 in the DLC wings only shows us the tip of the iceberg. In my opinion, and mind you, uh, take it with a grain of salt, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate may be the best Smash game to date, and I can't wait to share more with you guys soon as I complete this game. And as a side note, I literally cried during the opening of Smash Bros. Ultimate because simply of one thing, this game is real, when it really shouldn't be. And those were my top 10 games of 2018. Now I know this list was kind of crazy, and I could have gone a lot more in depth. But honestly, a lot of these games I talked about today, I did videos on. So, if you want to look at those, the links are in the description down below. Guys, have a great holiday. Happy New Year, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you guys soon for another episode of The Completionist. Bye!